All right, guys, bang, bang. A very special guest today. My friend Jonathan is here. Uh, how are you? I'm doing great. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I want to start uh, with your childhood and growing up Holy because you have a very unique experience that I think feeds into a lot of your worldview. But before we do that, I'm going to tell a story that uh, I don't know if you remember this or not. We worked at Facebook together. Uh, you were the last boss that I had at Facebook before I left. And there was a meeting. Um, the details don't necessarily matter as much, but uh, we were all in a meeting with some of the higher ups at Facebook. And there were some suggestions fl floating around as to things that we could do on Facebook to get more people to pay attention to the executives at Facebook. And one of the ideas was to put an interstitial over uh, <laughs> the uh, the page. <laughs> and, and a lot of people at Facebook were like, oh, that's a great idea. Like, uh, you know, we can basically like, that's how we get people's attention. And it was very much like a data driven. Okay. There's going to be a certain number of people who see this, that click that then, you know, opt into this action, whatever, all normal conversations for kind of a Silicon Valley firm. And all of a sudden, I don't know, maybe halfway through the meeting, you're like, uh, excuse me. <laughs> so I'm not from the United States. And let me explain to you what used to happen in television. <laughs> He's like, the dictator of our country would come on and be like, <laughs> now interrupting this programming. And like, this is the thing. And your point wasn't so much like the social media CEOs or dictators. It was more of just like, hey, there's multiple cultures that use uh, these platforms. Like we have to be sensitive to the way that this could be uh, received. And I always think about that because I think you, probably better than anybody I know, understand Silicon Valley. You've built companies, sold companies, worked at many of these tech companies, et cetera. But you also very much understand like, the world outside the United States and I've been able to like mesh that together. People got really angry in that meeting, if you remember. It was very tense. I do remember that. And I, and I left and the, well, that was very important executive in that meeting. And I remember some of the guys from the team, you know, kind of higher up in the hierarchy than me saying, I've never see, seen these guys this angry ever you know, in 10 <laughs> years of a company ever. And I was like, holy crap. Yeah, I do remember that. <laughs> yeah, I do remember fun. them getting mad. I was going to leave yeah. that part out, but yeah. Yeah, they got really well, <laughs> tense. You know, there was a very tense meeting, yeah. Well, I think that there's, uh, there's probably some uh, hint of truth in everything, right? Of just like, yeah, like that might not have been a good idea. And thankfully, we didn't do it. So yeah. like, okay. Yeah. Um, that was a tough job you have there, I remember. You had a tough kind of... At the intersection of a lot of things at Facebook, you had to deal with I was a lot very, of people. I was very unprepared for that. I was a 25, 26 year old kid, and um, I was asked to basically interface with these people on a pretty yeah. periodic basis, but also then to interact with other executives. And you know, it's like a minnow getting thrown in with the sharks, and you're like, oh, okay. Yeah, and I think I think what happens one of the reasons that job is hard is because if you if you are <laughs> a, before that you were doing that if you were starting companies or that's generally hustling, you have an output mentality. You're like, how the how do I get stuff out? How do I get a podcast out, a new product out, a new feature out? And you're outcome oriented. In a large company, you have to be input oriented. You have to go like, so what do you want VP of X? What do you want VP of Y? And you're like, well, if I phrase it like so, are we all in agreement? And can we take that to the higher ups? And and you were, I remember, in a role that had a lot of that. <laughs> that was very painful. That was very painful. I I think. I always, to this day, say uh, it was nine, it was, uh, no, three months, give or take, in this specific role. <laughs> yes. And uh, I got into the role because basically some of the executives were like, hey, we think that this guy would be good at this because he had done some other stuff. Yeah. They went to uh, my boss's boss at the time. I remember. <laughs> Hey, can we talk to him about doing this? And they were like, no. And like, we're just still going to talk to him. Yes. yes. So it wasn't much choice. Yeah. <laughs> Did it. It was awesome. You know, got to interface with all these people. Really I, good people. I that learned, team had amazing people. I learned more than I've ever learned. And yeah. In a 90-day period, I learned, I still to this day believe I learned more in that role than anything else. But I was very unprepared for that role. Yeah, it was, it was brutal. <laughs> it was brutal. But it was good people to work with. They were, they, they were, they were hardcore, good, talented, you know. To this day, people. I will still... I think that this is probably true. There's nobody better than that team that in terms of, uh, and we're talking about some of the earliest Facebook employees that have you know risen up through the ranks and, and still are in charge today. Uh, the combination of product, analytics, growth, like like everything together. Yeah, 
you could give them any problem in technology and they got a shot. They're amazing. Very resilient, really yes. hardworking. Just good people. But yes. All right. You're not there anymore. Yeah, that's fine. Well, we're okay. We're both out. I learned. That's fine. <laughs> but there was many walk and talks that we did yes, where John was like, hey, listen, many, all right, so here's the many, deal. <laughs> many, many. And we talk about, I remember Build talking consensus. about, yeah, yeah. I, I was learning as well with you, to be honest. I don't know what I was doing. Yeah. You grew up in Venezuela, which, yeah. uh, I think uh, with some of the background knowledge of being able to say that in that meeting of yeah. like, hey, let's, yeah. let's maybe cool it a little yeah. bit here. Uh, what was that like? <laughs> it's interesting. I grew up middle class in, in Venezuela, and that's actually very comfortable to some degree. You know, my, my, both my parents worked at a kind of state-owned companies. My okay. dad worked at the oil state-owned state company, you know, called PDVSA. PDVSA was a top 10 company by market cap for a while my mom worked at the uh kind of the uh alcoa like the you know steel state-owned company um it was a good comfortable life but it's also a you know very unequal society and a very unstable society um i got mugged growing up several times my mom got mugged growing up several times get out of the car and the, the car goes uh, my dad got mugged several times and I would negotiate with guys like take take the shoes don't take the watch or whatever just like don't mm -hmm. don't leave me hanging that my brother got um what's called express kidnapped you know like for a couple of hours well they they grab you coming out of like um I didn't coming out of this isn't even where we lived it was like a coming out of I don't know Mountain View in California like a really nice neighborhood uh, at 8 p.m on a Tuesday from like imagine CVS and they're like we're getting in your car and he was kidnapped for a couple of hours <clears throat> and my brother my brother was very effective persuading them that we have no money <laughs> like, i don't know what you're gonna take and, and my brother remembers distinctively the thing that shocked him the most is that by all material accounts those guys were better off than him he was like <laughs> your your car is better your shoes are better your jeans are better your what your glasses everything you guys better. are the cool kids yeah, you're, you, i should <laughs> And he's like, let's take my debit card and just take whatever. It won't, it won't be much. And they were very disappointed. Um, I got mugged by police once growing really? up. Growing up, I was in a red light and they got in the car and they're like, drive. And, 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 and I remember my mom used to own a small shop where she sold, um, after she left the, the state company, she sold uh, lottery tickets and I had the money for the price. And I'm like, you cannot touch that. That's my mom's. And that's someone else's. You know, these guys are police. They're like, yeah, we won't, we won't take that. And they, <laughs> they were so angry at me because I had, I remember, 20 bolivares, which is like nothing in my wallet. And they're like, I, I can't believe that's enough. And we get, we, we, we ran out. So it was a lot of crime and a lot of insecurity. Um, at least there's honor among the thieves. There right? is. Oh, there's, they can be very kind. Yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, and then um, there was a lot of political turmoil um, and then kind of financial turmoil, right? Um, you know, when I grew, when I was born, the the, the exchange rate was four four point three, so four point three bolivares for one U.S. dollar. Okay, at the time I was like eight or nine, I can recall. What I could remember this it was sixteen, so four x basically. Right. By the time I left college, it was a thousand. Right now, so I, I kind of lost track here, but I think I want to say that because they debased the currency twice and changed names with this kind of. And yeah. basically, we, when you're talking about debase, not just like printed more, like literally they took zeros off the end of the currency. But that's right. Yeah. And rename it. And, so and, like it was a million Bolivia or whatever. Right. And now it says a thousand. Right. And so and you're like, where did the zeros go? And they had this kind of over, we were talking before about over having overconfidence and like the perils of overconfidence, right? These guys will call the debased Bolivar the Bolivar Fuerte, the strong Bolivar. This one's stronger, <laughs> has less zeros, right? It's a, <laughs> right? <laughs> so I, I want to say that on the Bolivar that I grew up on, the, the weak, the weak one, the weak one. <laughs> this guy. Um, right now, I think the exchange rate would be three billion. Wait, what? Three billion. <laughs> I think it's thirty thousand, but then three billion on you know. Yeah. On so the weak on the weak one. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, so before they took all the zeros off, it literally went from four to three billion. Well, it never really showed the ticket three billion because it was debased. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But but yes, if you if you anchor on that Bolivar, if you anchor on that Bolivar and go all the way to today, it's three billion. So, so it's a lot for, of change, to, right? To give people who just to like hammer the point home, if you wanted to buy one dollar as a kid, you needed four of the local currency. That's right. And you would get one dollar in exchange. You go That's to the right. bank, hey here's four, give me one. 
Now you'd have to show up with three billion. That's right. And so, and, and yeah. they literally would be like, "You'd be like, how do I carry that?" To That's the- right. That's right. That's right. And 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 now in this happens in Venezuela. I haven't there, been there in a while, but it happens in Venezuela. You can see this in Colombia as well, in the frontier, in the border. Uh, even the newer Bolivares, which also have been debased and kind of weakened a ton, they're used for um, um, like art. Yeah, art and crafts. Yeah. So they'll do like a they'll do like a purse made out of the Bolivares. So they'll make um, a little plane or. They're, they're worthless, right? Growing up in that environment, do people know? Like, do they realize it? Or is it just like, oh, that's how it is everywhere? That's a good question. I, I'm not sure to what extent things are being realized. I, I, I do think people realize inflation is kind of, it can be seen. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I remember having conversations uh, as a kid and in the streets where, you know, because you see inflations in, inflation in two ways, right? One way is things get more expensive. The other way is that products get uh, refactored to s- maintain the price, but be less, less quantity, less quality, whatever it may be. So I, I remember uh, a, a this chocolate that we liked growing up that kind of kept the price for a long time. <laughs> it, it just got tiny, right? It went from this to this to this to this to this. <laughs> so it, it, you know, and people know, right? Uh, and they know it doesn't kind of... The price is the same. What you get is different. <laughs> right. So you, you can also do that, right? Uh, and a lot of, that, that happened a ton, right? Uh, and we kept getting, you know, you know, the bags of chips with like less and less. It was just, the course, loaf of bread just becomes one slice. <laughs> right. And so, so all of that keeps happening. And so people are aware and people are aware of the kind of purchasing power. That, that's something very real. What I don't think people realize fully is that um, is how inflation is an indirect tax on the poor. Mm. That's a piece that I'm not sure is visible because what happens is that if you live in a country that is highly inflationary uh, and you're able to save in a strong currency, uh, for local expenditures, uh, inflation is actually beneficiary mm-hmm. in the sense that you know if it's like if the if 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 the if the things get debased, but your your savings get stronger, you can come back and then buy more. Mm-hmm. And so your 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 you know purchasing power and your quality of life doesn't get that affected. If you're saving in the local currency, because you can't take money out or you have a lot of expenses, it, then it's a pretty clear tax. Mm-hmm. And I'm not sure people follow that. I think the other thing that happens is that inflation is an amazing indirect tax uh, for governments because they can divert um, responsibility. So they can say, look at the chocolate factory. They're making the chocolate smaller. That's not right. Or look at the coffee shop. The coffee now is 10 times more expensive. That's not okay. You're exploiting people. And so it's very easy to like divert responsibility for the indirect tax. Uh, and so it's very, very popular for uh, governments, right? It's very useful to them. You're talking about Venezuela. You could be talking about the United States. Yeah, I mean, in that's terms right. of inflation affecting the poor, in terms of the divers- the diversion of blame, in terms of the arguments of exploitation, uh, minimum wage. I mean, all of this stuff is the exact same in the two countries, maybe on a different level of right. severity, right? But systematically, it's the same thing. That's right. I think that the other lesson that, that you get from the US that it's less apparent in a place like Venezuela but I think it's very important is that when you, and this kind of graphs are very popular circulating around the internet, right? When you see the lines of inflation, you're like, well, car, you know, flights have gone really cheap or cars have gone really cheap, but look at education or look at healthcare. And, and then if you look at those costs and you look at who's impacting them, you can see how regressive uh, that tax, the inflation is, like how, mm-hmm. who's actually paying that bill. Mm-hmm. And it's not being paid equally. It's mm-hmm. being paid very unequally. And the poor suffer more. Right, because those are the things that they spend more money. That's a percentage of, of income. Healthcare is a smaller uh, expense than uh, than it is for someone who's poor. And so, if that goes up, you disproportionately hit the poor the, the poor population. There's a study that um, I will try to find again. I'll put in the show notes for everyone uh, that looked. I think it was in uh, the UK, so not in the United States, but uh, in, in an English speaking kind of developed nation, um, and. It looked at after the 2008 financial crisis, they basically broke down the socioeconomic uh, kind of ladder into 20% buckets. So top 20%, next 20, all the way down, right? And what it said was, uh, by their estimation, coming out of the 2008 financial crisis, the bottom 40% of uh, people in their country uh, were experiencing somewhere between 6 to 10% inflation levels. So when you think about that, the official numbers, 
two, maybe two and a half percent. It's kind of a blend across society. 10% every year, things are going, I mean, you, you just can't keep up, right? It's that feeling of everything going up. But I always go back to like, the system is doing exactly what it's designed to do. They want to devalue the currency so people spend or invest and keep velocity of money going. It's just only that like half the population knows that and acts accordingly, right? They buy assets, they do all this. Everyone else is just trying to do their job and eat, right? I mean, they, they, there's no uh, understanding of economics. There's no understanding of how money works. There's no understanding of what I should do to protect my wealth or grow my wealth or anything. It's 45% of Americans don't even own a single investable asset. And so it's actually the education gap seems to be what exposes people more than anything because the system's doing what they designed it to do, right? That's and that's right. the scary part. That's right. And if you look at, this is true in a place like Venezuela, like in the US, the more so there. Imagine you're in Venezuela and imagine you have uh, excess income that can be turned into savings of $75. How do you turn the equivalent in Bolivares to $75? What's a financial system that provides that to that saving? How do you do that without being charged $25 in the transaction or whatever mm -hmm. that might be? Same here, right? I mean, it's part of the problem is that it is hard through the financial system and even to, 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 to save, you know, to, to save lower amounts over long periods of time. It's, it's expensive. Um, and, and, the, and the system is geared towards debt where, where, yes. way more than savings. And so there's great products to leverage up there are not that many great products to kind of save up. There's mm -hmm. new stuff and a lot of the most kind of cool, interesting stuff in fintech is trying to solve for that. Uh, but it's education plus infrastructure. When you think about a theme in the world, you've written about before, mm -hmm. like the dissipation of power, like this whole idea that uh, maybe the last, I don't know, 50 years or so, there was the concentration of power. How do we create more efficiency? Seed in politics. Venezuela is like the perfect example. There's many other countries where uh, consolidation of power leads to bad things. Absolute power corrupts absolutely, all that. But you also see it in corporations, right? And I think uh, one of these pieces that you wrote was uh, this whole idea that um, when you have 100 small two-person companies, you have to negotiate contracts. You have to become uh, transactionally efficient and all this stuff. It actually just makes sense. Like, why don't we just put all the hundred different companies of two people into a 200 person organization and we'll create top down hierarchy. And now all of a sudden we don't need to negotiate every time we need to do a transaction. Like it's just internal. And so we can create efficiencies and, and get this, but it's centralized. It feels like the world is rejecting this a little bit or, or trying to head in a different direction with this dissipation of power. Like, how do you look at that today? Yeah. So I think the, the one thing that I would say that is interesting to consider uh, for people who are kind of strong advocates of decentralization and diffusion of power and so forth is kind of what you're saying, that centralization is really valuable. Like it has a bunch of things. You were referring to a, a pretty famous book in kind of the microeconomic literature called The Theory of the Firm. And so this guy goes through like the logic for why firms are created and companies are created, which is kind of what you when you, you walk us through. And that that's, I think, exactly so. So th it makes sense to do that, right? Um, let's just walk that argument four steps ahead and just see see how it plays out and why that becomes an issue. He's like, well, th that now it's concentrated, right? So now maybe they are underserving a subsection of the market. And so you and I get together and we're like, well, we're going to fight the big company. We're going to serve this kind of small niche. Um, Turns out the company controls kind of distribution channels. Turns out the, the company can kind of underbid uh, products or overbid on products to kind of get us get us out of the of the marketplace. And so 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 now it's hard to compete and and hard to serve this kind of subset of the market that that needs serving. And so now regulation is issued and, and ensued. And so laws get 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 put together to help us um, kind of fight. Uh, but what turns out is that. Uh, laws are hard to follow, and so more laws are built to protect the core law. Maybe you maybe you get a constitution, but then you're like, well, we got to protect that, so we got to put some laws. And then you're like, well, you want to protect those as well, and you put more. And this is, I mean, this is a history of kind of liturgical practices in religions as well, right? Like I'm Jewish, and and it starts simple, and then we get a ton, <laughs> right? And 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 this idea in Judaism exists of like defense of the law which is our laws to protect the law. Uh, <laughs> and this happens on like the civil society as well. And so you, you, you bring in government to protect the little guy so they compete with a big guy who became big for arguably good reasons, but then perhaps 
not so much after a while. And then the laws in, in itself, they become big. And the guys who issue the laws kind of are nested. In the, so now you're like at that point where you're describing, where you're like, oh, the, um, the system is becoming a sclerotic. It's like not moving, right? And so, uh, you know, the guys at the Santa Fe Institute has this idea called like the edge of chaos. And they're like, you know, we live in this kind of, in this kind of edge where, you know, people go bankrupt and people die and we suffer. And yet this is where still things happen. If it's too, uh, too uh, rigid and too static and too concentrated and centralized, stuff doesn't happen. Change doesn't happen. Improvement doesn't happen. If it's too kind of gassy, you know, and kind of and dispersed, no coordination is possible. It becomes really, really hard. So there's like some place where you want to be. And so, and so to your point, um, you know, the U.S. in the last 30 years has been, you know, the single power in the world. That's really unusual, right? Just like, you know, history wise. Um, and I think it's pretty patently obvious to everyone right now that China is a real contender. And, and, and you look at that in corporations, to your point, you see like strong concentration of power on subsections of society and commerce and so forth. And so, and so sometimes you have to work to kind of concentrate more power because it's kind of too diffuse. And sometimes you have to work to kind of diffuse it, to diffuse power. And I think a lot of what I think, um, I think we're call, call for, call on to work on is to diffuse some of this. And I think you can work on a bunch of different verticals, but there's some, there's too much concentration and not enough change and innovation and kind of improvement. And we have to, we have to diffuse, I think. What's up guys, bang, bang. I hope you're enjoying this conversation. But before we go any further, I wanna quickly tell you about today's sponsor. BlockFi. BlockFi's got four different financial products for crypto investors. You can deposit crypto and earn up to 8.6% APY in an interest-bearing account. You can deposit crypto and take out a US dollar loan against your crypto collateral. You can use their cryptocurrency exchange and have no trading fees, or you can get a new Bitcoin rewards credit card. It's a normal credit card that when you swipe, you get Bitcoin back rather than cash back or airline miles. I'm an investor in the business and a very happy user. I think you will be too when you go to blockfi.com slash pomp. Again, blockfi.com slash pomp. Go check it out and let me know what you think. All right, let's get back into this conversation. I hope you enjoy it. It almost feels like uh, moderation is good, right? Yeah. Too much decentralization, and eh, maybe that doesn't work. Too much centralization, and eh, maybe that doesn't work. And there's this like happy medium. Uh, but it's not just, okay, everything is halfway centralized, decentralized. It's, it's more so there's certain things where decentralization is really, really important. And then there's certain things where centralization is really, really important. And society is trying to figure that out, right? Yeah, as we get. I, I can imagine, you know, I can imagine if you think of yourself in different times of history, being kind of consistent in values and principles, and at some point yelling, you know, break the kingdom, you know, <laughs> on their own, you know, and some other time of, of history saying, let's bring the kingdoms together and let's consolidate. And you, I think you probably are remaining, uh, principled, you know, mm -hmm. uh, 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 by doing things that seem very opposite. Uh, I do feel that we're at a point where a lot of like, let's break the kingdoms feels important yeah. to me, right? Uh, I, I, I tend to agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Bitcoin is interesting because um, it's doing some of this. Yeah. Very unique way, uh, still an untold story or kind of an unfinished story, but we'll, we'll see what happens. You are, should be like a poster boy for having sympathy for what Bitcoin's trying to accomplish. Come from Venezuela, hyperinflation, there's concentration of political power. You've seen um, kind of this play out through your lifetime across many different verticals. How do you think about the asset itself? And I'm cheating because I know that you think it's important, but yeah. just like, like what is the framework you use to evaluate it given that you could use so many different frameworks? Yeah. Um, well, I'll say this perhaps on some historical context. And so I remember the first time I heard about it was by a colleague, which actually was actually ex Facebook and joined my startup before we joined Facebook. And, um, you know, like a s bright, strong libertarian. And okay. it was like, this thing is the future. And I remember thinking, you know, the typical concerns around kind of government regulation and, you know, and the laws that provide coinage and all, all this type of stuff and getting really concerned. Um, but, you know, I also remember, I remember growing up in Venezuela, um, one of my professors is a guy called Leopoldo Lopez, who's become a, an important member of the opposition. He's now in Spain and went through hell on earth on some of the government's uh, prisons. And I remember in a class that I had with him, he was like, the importance of an independent um, Fed, 
or the equivalent really? of the Fed. The importance of an independent Fed. And a lot of the kind of traditional economics mm -hmm. um, have have argued for this, have argued for like the Fed should um, aim to control inflation, to have an inflation target, which should be independent of the fiscal policy. So one thing is how much money we're going to spend as a government to achieve the government goals, and that should remain independent of the Fed goal, which should be to manage inflation. Um, that's really hard for it to happen, right? Independence. <clears throat> the independence. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, but, but it's important. We, we recognize that we need predictable monetary policy to, for the agents to, to, to act uh, in the best interest of themselves and the economy. Mm -hmm. If the monetary policy is uh, unpredictable, then it's very hard to uh, plan inventories. Uh, it's very hard to control import-exports. It's very hard to price things. Um, and so I think just from a practical standpoint, before... A lot of the kind of cyberpunk uh, libertarian philosophy that gets uh, behind Bitcoin that may be possible. I think the idea of like same predictable monetary policies, I think is a non-controversial position among many economists. Basically what you're arguing is if you take widely accepted kind of consensus view, traditional economic viewpoints like predictability, uh, like independence of the Fed or central bank or whatever, and you apply it to the lens of Bitcoin, there's checks. That, that gets you 30% there. Yeah. That, yeah. that gets you a third there, maybe. Yeah. And you're so like, monetary policy is transparent and programmatic. Programmatic and predictability are just two different words that mean you know pretty much the same thing. Yeah, pro program, pro <laughs> programmable is just like the uh, a strong incarnation of predictability, right? Yes. It becomes highly predictable. Independent. Yeah. Decentralized. Those are, again, you know, two different words for two different industries, but basically, you know, uh, rely on each other or, or are kind of related to each other. That's right. And then if that gets you 30 percent, what's the rest? Yeah. So, so I think the, 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 the rest is that you realize how hard it is to accomplish that. Mm -hmm. um, and you realize that uh, the monetary policy of a nation is really powerful, that it can be used uh, as a, a diplomatic tool in other nations, that it can be used as a domestic policy tool uh, to, you know, gen to pass a bunch of money to a bunch of people or, or whatever that may be in, in a way that is not organic. Organic. So that one piece is you realize that there's a bunch of incentives in that system that go against that um, ideal and that push against it. That, that's one piece. Then the other piece uh, that, that is important is that uh, and, I, and I, I grew up and to a large degree, I remain kind of very kind of liberal, kind of almost to the left in, in many issues. But I think one thing that Hayek uh, and kind of the father of kind of libertarian economics has right is that price convey information, mm -hmm. right? Uh, price is the way we discover truth in the market. Mm -hmm. And so if, if you tinker with prices because of foreign or domestic policy objectives, um, you're not just you know, uh, indirectly taxing the wrong people. You're not also making it also on, on hard. You actually screwed up the market mechanism. Mm -hmm. And I've seen, I, I've seen in practice efforts to subvert the market mechanism for like a top-down mechanism, and it does, does not work. It's really, really, really bad. This is, uh, this is not only the history of Russia, but you can just see it. Whatever this happens, it's just top-down. It's, it's just pretty hard, and so. So I think those those that is like the other third, which is like prices are really really important, and the incentive structure is against it. And I think that all kind of checks. And I think the last piece is the piece that you realize that uh, this thing is not cannot be censored, cannot be controlled. So it means that no one can grab power over it. And so going back to the other point is that when you look at this concentration of power. What Bitcoin has is it, it has the property of diffusion of power. No one has to be in control. And that's a notion that is very scary and very, um, it's not clear if that's going to work or not. I mean, we've tried full concentration of power. That doesn't quite work well. We tried kind of market plus governments and, and it works better, but it has a bunch of issues. But this idea that we can effectively take something that we want it to be predictable and that we force it to be predictable and it cannot be controlled by anyone else, it's insane. And so I think once you see that and you see that it's possible, it's really a, a different world. And, and you see examples of all of that. I mean, I, there's a bunch of news uh, on the news right now on kind of miners being deplatformed and kind of China in China. Yeah. Uh, 
I don't see anyone coordinating the migration of that, those machines somewhere else. And yet, it's happening. It's happening. They're being migrated. Um, you know, the hash power has dropped dramatically. Is the network threatened or unsecured? And so I think the magic here is that we've come up with a way of effectively diffuse power without becoming chaotic, but the opposite. There's no concentration of power and we get full predictability. I think when you see all of that, you're like, well, to your point, it still has to play out, but you're like, this is a worthy experiment, if nothing else. It almost feels like when you strip away sentiment, right? And you kind of say, shut Twitter off, stop looking at the US dollar exchange price, shut the television off, like just look at the actual yeah, fundamental Stop structure. refreshing the app. Yeah, like, like all these <laughs> things, right? Just like, like, like time out for a second. Yeah. And you just look at it from a pure structure standpoint. It's got to be one of the most beautifully designed kind of valuable things at that viewpoint of technology in a long time. Like maybe the internet, right, is probably like the other big one where you're like, okay, like there's kind of like this distributed system where people all kind of work together. Information can flow back and forth. And um, yeah, there's some centralization here or there that actually makes it work and, and whatever. But when you look at this, you're like, I can't really think of that many other things that if this becomes what it has the promise to become, will be more important, right? And value has kind of all kinds of, you know, subjective type things that you can right. apply. Like, is it priced in Bolivars or dollars, yeah. right? But just, it's almost like it was perfectly designed. And, and the word perfect, I think, is scary because nothing's really perfect, but it does check a lot of these boxes. And so it's maybe the best that we've seen so far out of yeah. all the monetary policies. Well, I, I think, so I, I would agree. I think it's a thing of beauty. Right mm -hmm. from like a technological standpoint, from a societal standpoint, so it's it's amazing. Um, but I think you, I think in in I think you're right also in the kind of description of making think think thinking it's perfect in, in insofar as it's very narrow. Mm -hmm. Like it does one thing, doesn't doesn't do more, uh, and it's here's a clear meaning transparent, predictable, uh, permissionless, not censorable, monetary policy. Mm -hmm. Which is what I think. There's some people who don't agree with this, and some guys in the New York Times will go and write about the importance of like active monetary policy, and I would tend to disagree. But I think there's a bunch of guys who are far from the crypto punk uh, libertarian world that would say we need predictable monetary policy. We need bands in which we can operate, so some flexibility maybe, but just some some somewhat predictable. Um, and and this. Bitcoin achieves this specific goal. So to that sense, it's just very well tailored for a very specific thing. And so maybe we'll find something better. But I think part of it, what makes it amazing is that it's not actually trying to do too much. It's just really important. How important is it that we just saw kind of the exact opposite over the last 12, you know, 18 months or whatever with uh, basically completely unpredictable uh, monetary policy, emergency interest rate cuts, uh, trillions of dollars of quantitative easing like it almost feels like we basically over the last decade or so have seen bitcoin gain adoption slowly but surely and kind of chugging along technology continue to work individuals were really kind of attracted to it then you start to get a couple of financial institutions that were oh, this is interesting and then covid hits you get literally just mass chaos complete uncertainty uh the most extreme version of the usage of a malleable kind of unpredictable monetary policy. And then, oh, there's this other thing like just keeps doing what it does. And so now it's like this black and white comparison of, hey, here's the extreme of one world and then here's like the other extreme essentially. Yeah. And it seems like that really opened a lot of people's eyes to like, oh, maybe I can't even describe why, but like this is interesting because this other thing is chaos. Yeah. Well, that's, I think, I think there's one side of the argument that I would, that that's against that or in front of that, which is that I think uh, the, the maybe the Bitcoin community tends to um, I think understate the power of the U.S. dollar. The United States is an insanely powerful country. Mm -hmm. uh, it has an uh, insanely strong economy. So I think kind of the U.S. the token, whatever you government token, I think it's it'll stay here for a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. I think the U.S. has um, advantages that China doesn't have. It's an open country that accepts immigration, that takes talent, uh, that speaks a language that people can learn. Um, Chinese is hard to learn. 
Um, I think we have some disadvantages kind of military-wise. We have like a long old platform that needs to be upgraded uh, to fight more wars and so forth. But the U.S. is very powerful. So I think the, so, so what that means is that like companies that can make uh, a string of mistakes and that they're still there because kind of the core business is so powerful and you see that in technology all the time, the U.S. can kind of screw up um, many things uh, from now to the immediate future and remain, I believe, uh, particularly as, as it pertains to the strength of the U.S. dollar. But uh, I, I do think that when you look at, um, like if you, when you look at what the dollar can buy, and when you look at kind of the purchasing power, particularly domestically, right? Um, I think I think you I think you're right. I think people are seeing maybe this is not the store of value that I thought it was. Maybe it's being kind of compromised. And I think it's, as I said, I think it's a larger theme where mm -hmm. the U.S. was the only country, the U.S. was the only dollar that lasted about thirty years. That's gone. Uh, I don't see the euro being particularly strengthened in that regard. As I said, the Chinese currency is tied up with a bunch of like closeness in the Chinese economy. So. So I think people are looking for like stable, predictable store of value, and I think they can can fill that that role. That's in the U.S. If you're outside of the U.S., if you're in El Salvador, if you're in Venezuela, then then the because the U.S. dollar is used as a kind of diplomat diplomatic uh, um, kind of nonviolent intervention tool, uh, then I think the diversification out of that kind of may prove to be important for them. Uh, and then the question is like going back to the U.S. Uh, how how Again, what's what will remain for a very long time and hopefully forever, like a strong economy and an open society that takes on talent and so forth. Uh, how does that connect with like this store of value? I mean, the U.S. has gold in Fort Knox and, and they're proud of it. I don't I don't see them complaining about it, even though it has been kind of made illegal in a bunch of transactions in the U.S. Um, I, I don't see why the U.S. cannot be open about this in the future. But but I think it's not. I, I do think it opens their eyes, but I think. Yeah, I think the U.S. dollar will be okay. Talk more about El Salvador and kind of when you heard that news, uh, just given that South and Central America, I think you understand to some degree just having grown up. Um, and then Bitcoin and technology, I think you understand pretty well as well. And so you put those th two things together. Most people are evaluating this from the the American perspective, right? I look at it I'm like, oh, this is amazing. They're going to go give Bitcoin to everybody. How do you think of it? Is it... A dangerous thing? Is it a positive thing? Is it like a wait and see and like there's action that needs to be behind the words or like just like what how do you evaluate something like that? I'm not sure to be honest because I think part of the challenge for me is that um, um, I don't know how to judge the actions of a president that has a bunch of power and control of Congress um, when they do something around this. I think it's net positive for society and um, but I, I, and I don't have an argument against any of this, uh, like a well thought of argument. Um, but I, I, I hope that Bitcoin gets in the hands of as many people as possible before, you know, governments start to get involved. Just because I think the power of what it can be will be stronger, mm -hmm. the more kind of distributed, and the more in the hands of more people. And so I kind of get a, a little bit nervous. Uh, but, but I do think that um, if I want to be optimistic, I think the idea of a government uh, thinking through the future and how they can participate in it and how can they kind of do leapfrogging, I, I think it's important. So I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, in many developing nations, there, there never was a, a kind of phone infrastructure the way they had in the US or Europe. Cellular phones effectively leapfrog that into, into where it is today. That was important. It was important to invest in those towers and not invest in kind of cables under the ground b because it allowed those economies to like get the iPhone and get Android and get apps and and and, and kind of really move forward. And so I I do some of these financial institutions and services and, and kind of economy in these economies are, are are old and inefficient and expensive and unfair. And so what's hope what is interesting for me is that if if the financial kind of systems of these countries can kind of leapfrog by adopting this technology, mm -hmm. I think that's really, really important. That's one. So I think Lightning becomes really interesting part of that story for me. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's one. I think the other piece is that I think um, I, I, I think it's important if these countries can get early in a store of value that has some space for appreciation. If that then, if that's what happens, then I will be excited for them to see take a little bit of risk that is not kind of country threatening in any in any important mm -hmm. way, but they have the ability to take risk that maybe the U.S. doesn't have and that they can benefit from that. And that that will be exciting exciting for me as well.
Yeah. It feels like um, most of the folks that I've talked to from cent, uh, South and Central America, there's this like cautious optimism, right? Hey, I see how this could be beneficial if it works out right. Uh, any country in that entire region, uh, there's always this uh, belief that um, you continue to rise in power. And then when you get the power, it's kind of like, what do you do with it? Right. And probably more so maybe the African continent, but more so than anywhere else in the world, South and Central America has seen the negative sides of what can happen with consolidated power. And it feels like when something like this occurs, there's an argument of like, oh, this could be used in a negative way, right? And, the, and we'll see kind of if that's true or not. But also then there's this argument of like the Trojan horse. Like it doesn't matter if you're a good guy or a bad guy. If you go and you help all of your citizens get Bitcoin, like you can't control it, right? And so yeah. like to some degree, uh, there's a diffusion of power, yeah. right? Just because you're literally using a freedom technology and you're giving it to everyone. Yeah. Um, but this brings us back to this piece that you wrote of kind of this diffusion of power where you talk about the idea of like, there's basically three reasons why somebody ascends to power and it's, they think that they can organize resources in society better. Uh, there's a self affirmation uh, or they basically benefit from the perks of yeah. being powerful. And in it, you essentially lay out, and I forget who uh, this argument comes from, but it's like, if you don't do the things that everyday people do very quickly, you almost lose touch with the everyday people. Right. Yeah. And so I think the examples that are used are like, you know, if you don't make your own coffee, if you don't, you know, uh, drive your own car, like all this stuff yeah. for no other reason than just, you don't do it. It's kind of hard to relate to people who do that on a daily yeah. basis. Right. Yeah, the, the thing, the thing to realize at this for me is yeah, there's this famous Lord Acton, you know, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. Kind of quote. I think that's very true. And I think, I think it's very important to stay vigilant to that. And I think that's where I've, I've moved to in that journey to, to some extent where I'm like, I'm just generally suspicious of power and <laughs> generally suspicious and, and generally kind of feel a sense of kind of compassion to some degree with people who hold a lot of power. You see people who hold a lot of power in big corporations, technology and otherwise always in, uh, in impossible situations, right? Like almost you, almost they don't want the power. And, and you see, for example, um, Jack Dorsey at, at 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 Twitter advocating for this Blue Sky project that effectively, and and you see it, it you know takes power out of him and, and you see him on the uh, on the interviews that has or whatever the subpoenas that has been uh, asked to 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 attend to in Congress effectively saying should we have I mean sure I, I, should you have that much power should I have that much power and I think before that meant chaos. And I think now that means kind of at the edge of chaos. It's mm -hmm. kind of crazy, but but it works. Kind of the machines, the mining machines will go where they need to go. The bitcoins will go where they need to go. The exchanges will do what they have to do. The nodes will do what they have to do. The individuals will be sovereign and they'll make their own calls. So so I, I think there's something to that, right? Where, yeah, where probably the, pro probably the problem is power. And we now have a kind of anti-power or delusion of power uh, the illusion of power kind of technology that it's that's now available. Jack is so fascinating because I, I'm pretty sure he explicitly says uh, around all the deplatforming, shutting accounts, all stuff. He's like, I don't want to be the one doing this, right? Or or like we like we <laughs> like we basically we this is not something we signed up for, yeah. right? We have to do the best we can to do what we can in the meantime. But the blue sky thing is kind of like, yeah. hey, how do we give the power, you know, elsewhere? What's fascinating to me is uh, for every one person like that, there's a hundred that they want the power, yeah. right? And, and then they're actively working to get yeah. the power. And so it, it really, um, it begs the question, like, will it take technologists building the technology to diffuse power regardless of what the incumbents think? Or do we get to some point where people start to say, ah, you know, maybe I don't need the power. Like, like it feels to me that Jack kind of raising his hand and saying, you know, we have to find a better way without us being the ones making these decisions. That's going to be a very unique, you know, kind of path. Most of the times it's going to just be more of technology taking the power regardless of what the incumbents we'll, think. We'll see. I think I think it's like, if I have to guess, it's like, think about Jack in a meeting, in a content moderation meeting. Like, I, I can't imagine anyone enjoying that meeting, right? <laughs> Do you imagine that being pleasurable or i don't know if mark no. from facebook is doing this or you know susan in youtube I, I i don't imagine this being fun i imagine this being really really painful um and everyone knowing it's impossible it's an impossible task yeah 
And, and it's unclear why it's been, for all the shit that these guys are getting, I mean, I'm on the side of Facebook on all of this. It's like, why are they being asked to do this? Like, I think a modern civil, like a modern society would have like an um, API interface between the courts and <laughs> Facebook. And I would go and say, I think this is harassment. And then we have a, we have- We have content court. <laughs> we, have, we, have, we have laws for this. We have amendments for this. We have the civil rights. We, 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 have, we have laws that we have decided in a democratic environment that decide if that is harassment or not and if it's punishable by law or not. And so I would click and then some guy in court it will be a computer you go like, okay, now now, we're, now we'll go to court and there'll be, we'll see, we'll, you see your day in court and there'll be judge and we'll decide. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure why this is in the hands of this guy. Jonathan, why did you tweet this? <laughs> right? Okay, how did you feel when you got it? <laughs> I mean, if it's worth if it's worth discussing and it needs to be solved by a third party, then we have courts for this. And then maybe we need to hire more people in court. And we have, a, and then court, content moderation shouldn't happen in a Deloitte factory in, in Pakistan. I mean, maybe it should happen in, in our local courts. Like, my point is that, um, I don't think they want this. Mm -hmm. The government doesn't want to take it. Mm -hmm. the, which is Everyone the point, wants to point fingers at each which other. Which is the point that I'm making. Then maybe they should, we should have a project to de develop an API interface into, between the courts and all these guys. I don't think the government wants to do that. I don't think they want to staff that up. I don't think they're capable of doing it. I don't think they want to deal with the consequences. And so I think Mark and Jack and all these guys rightfully so are saying, I think it's you. You need to tell us. I was a democratically elected. Right, I mean, you yeah. Need, what, uh, what are the rules, and then we can what are the, apply? I, mean, I, I can decide to kick someone out on my own terms, but but if you're asking me to kick someone and you're complaining that I didn't do it, then 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 maybe you should, you know, what I mean? maybe 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 it's, maybe it's on you. Do you worry? Do you worry? Sorry, no, yeah. Do you worry that when we get into that world, um, there is uh, the nation state or the court system now choosing who gets silenced, who doesn't? The it's in, well, I think I think that's right. I think it's impossible. I think the nation state- That's just as bad as asking Mark well, or Jack. I think the nation state model, is, it, it's not compatible with this. Mm. You know, I, I think I almost imagine the world like the medieval times, but but we have like the Amazon kingdom and we have the Facebook kingdom and it spans across, you know, geographies. And so so I don't think the nation state is like the right tooling for this. So I, th I think Jack is right in saying maybe 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 something like Blue Sky, maybe, maybe no one owns it. Yeah. Maybe, maybe you kind of choose your own adventure. Maybe you choose your own adventure. And it's on you. Uh, uh, and I think we just trust people to make the right decisions. And again, maybe there are courts and courts can, but the, this is not so centralized. So so I don't know. I, I think uh, going back to the initial point, I, I would imagine, I don't know him and uh, you know, I, don't, I wouldn't presume that I know him by tweets, but I would imagine he doesn't like going to content moderation meetings. Mm -hmm. I would imagine that's a pain. And I would imagine he recognized Congress uh, asking questions about bets they made among each other and like showing at times complete ignorance of technology, which is scary, as he is a steward of that company, that he says, now we have a technology where a way of not concentrating power in this way. Um, so I don't think people like power, yeah. <laughs> even the ones who have it, the, and, you know, at the end. And, and it also brings up like, is it so much that power gets eliminated or the power basically gets given to something that can't abuse the power, right? So Bitcoin being kind of the quintessential example of like, if you take the power from those that have it today and you uh, make Bitcoin more valuable and that becomes the global store value, let's say, you didn't really destroy power, right? What you did was you just shifted it, but you shifted it to an inanimate object that basically is programmatic, it's transparent, it's somewhat democratic in, in terms of things could change if everyone agrees or if, or if a large majority of people agree, but it's still powerful. Right, I, I think the way to think about it is, and and I think people sometimes, uh, I think I think a, a weak vector of attack to Bitcoin is when people say, oh, you told me Bitcoin is going to, you know, make some sort of like egalitarian financial world. <laughs> but see, the rich keep getting richer. Oh, the rich are continuing to going to get richer. Of course, I mean, if you have money and you convert it and you buy the right asset and appreciate it. So Bitcoin is not going to make the poor rich magically in some, uh, or none of these technologies. But I do think it eliminates power in the sense that, again, very narrowly, like if you are the chairman of the Fed in the U.S. and you are taking a bunch of considerations to decide what you're going to do with your monetary policy with the interest rates, uh, and some of them are in the benefit of some people, some of them are in the benefits of some other people, today or intergenerationally, maybe good for us and horrible for our kids, to the extent that Bitcoin becomes like a 
true store of value the way the U.S. it is in some cases in some cases in the kind of balance sheets of central banks in other nations. That's gone. That's gone. It's the monetary policy for Bitcoin is predictable uh, and non-changeable. And so that little piece of power, I mean, not fully. And as I said, I believe mm -hmm. the U.S. dollar will continue to be very strong. But but you've taken some of that out. So and who has that power? Really, we gave the power to an algorithm. So the algorithm is really powerful right now. And so when you think about that, it's this weird world where you're basically giving power. Like I always go back to just like uh, the the robot overlords are here and we love them. Yeah. Right, right? yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, you let the algorithms do everything from tell you what content to consume, what direction to drive down the streets, right, to what search results, uh, to where to eat. To what happens with the monetary I, policy? I, I, fi I find that argument to be completely kind of non-threatening to me. I mean, yeah. I, I think we are made to be bionic from the get-go. But we also have okay, like extension. To, but what I, mean, what I mean by that is that uh, we came up with tools very quickly. Mm -hmm. At some point, we start we stopped you know you know scraping the earth with our nails, and we invented a shovel. And without the shovel, a bunch of stuff would have been impossible. So it is an inorganic extension of our body for all sense and purposes, right? Uh, you could not function without the clothing and the heating mm -hmm. and, the, and the cameras. And these are like true inorganic extensions in our body. So I mean bionic in the sense that I don't think we're fully um, our, our, our biological matter. I think we are all these things that we, you know, Steve Jobs has this kind of uh, beautiful, like called the computer is the bicycle of the mind. Uh, it it really is like your mind works differently and gets wired differently and moves faster and to different places through the technology. So I, so I'm I don't see why it's a bad thing to depend on the cell phone to give me the weather, and I don't see why it's a bad thing if we agreed, as I, we said before, or not everyone agrees, but many of us agrees that monetary policy should be independent from fiscal policy and predictable that we make it so by using computers. I I, I don't find that threatening at all. I don't think it's a bad thing. Yeah. What what I think is fascinating is as we do more and more of this across our life, do we basically take power from humans and continue to give to algorithms? It's actually probably a pretty good thing. Like imagine um, somebody recently told me that uh, they're, they have a father who's older. I don't know how old he is. Uh, and he still looks at uh, MapQuest before he goes on a trip yeah, and he tries to memorize all the turns yeah. and they're, they get in the car with him like, Hey, tell yeah, me, is you, that can, better? you can use the GPS. Right. Yeah. And he's like, no, no, no. Like I, I got it. Yeah. <laughs> and so pretty, you know, uh, uncontroversial to say like, no, using the GPS yeah. would be better. But as we do that more and more, people just have to get comfortable with the fact that like the algorithms have the power, but if they're decentralized and no one controls them, because I think that's yeah. the problem right now is when you think of like big tech, right? Like let's take the argument that uh, against the technology companies, Yeah, it's not so much that the technology has power. It's that somebody controls the technology. Yeah. So if Facebook was completely decentralized and nobody controlled it, how many people would really be mad at Facebook? Eh. Yeah. I think a, a much, much less amount yeah. of people are mad if it's, it's decentralized. It's very useful that Mark is a human and has a face and you can point at it. Bad guy. Yeah, <laughs> it's very easy. <laughs> right? And you Very know, unfair also, I think. And, and I think that when you take that out of the equation, like in a situation with Bitcoin, there's nobody to point to. I think They're, that's true. I think the other piece, so related to the pointing, which is right, there's no one to point to. But I think the other reason is that it, it, it affects, I think what follows from that, I guess, is the, it, it, it appends our model for responsibilities and liabilities. Mm. So uh, here's an example that I, I used to hear before that I think is interesting. You know, algorithms are getting more into healthcare, right? And if you think of it from like a machine vision standpoint, reading a two-dimensional black and white image is not, you know, it's not harder than having a car drive itself, just to put it that way, right? And... <laughs> and, and so and so you tell people and you're like, well, the best human, a radiologist or whatever it is, analyzing the image will make, you know, 10 percent mistakes, 90 percent accu ac accurate. And then let's assume the machine is like 97 percent accurate. Three percent will make. Mistakes. So machine is better than humans. Right. If the human makes a mistake. Who's responsible? The human. It's very simple. And there's we have legal code that supports like man ways to manage this and ethical conduct and moral rules and so forth to deal with this. He'll say sorry. You know, we'll, we'll, it'll be a bunch of stuff that will happen, right? And, and an emotional like, and so forth. Or gaslight us, but yeah. 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 <laughs> now there's the algorithm. Make a mistake. Who's responsible? Mm -hmm. I have even not having who to blame is problematic. 
from mm-hmm. like an emotional standpoint. Now, is it the creator of the algorithms to blame? Who, who sh- will he lose a medical practice? Like, will he be judged for malpractice? It's, it's very hard from like our models to figure out who to, who to adjudicate uh, responsibility. Now, unlike Google Maps, which you can imagine Google being a nefarious actor, rerouting you from what it seems to be, you know, a low traffic kind of green path outside of the highway to kidnap you and take your car. They, they don't seem to be motivated. Uh, they don't seem to care too much about you and me, right? To yep. go and do that. But you could imagine that. The same way you could imagine that for healthcare. Bitcoin is pretty dumb from like computational standpoint. It's not going to reassess, uh, you know, it, it adjusts. I mean, you, you could not predict potentially like the hashing power, but it's at the, uh, being used at some point. But it's like a one, you know, one derivation from the kind of core algorithm that kind of it's mining at a certain rate on certain blocks on certain time. And that's not, so it's actually, actually almost dumb. Meaning I find the monetary policy of Bitcoin to be way less threatening. Imagine being a macro economist or a macro hedge fund manager, and you're waiting for Mr. Powell or whoever is a Fed guy. Have you seen these guys reading tea leaves? The conference room. Have you, or the conferences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have you seen the, the like the... It's, it, what, it's, what tie? What color tie? Did he say the word dovish or not? It's it's hysterical. It's astrology for grown men. It's 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 sad. It's astrology for grown men. That's exactly right. So you're going to tell me that that's more reassuring than a dumb algorithm that I told you in advance what's going to do and it's telling you predictably what's going to do on something where you want something extremely predictable. So I would argue that, I mean, the machines are coming. Uh, it has a bunch of implications that are serious and we should be concerned about them. Uh, I think people should look at Google Maps and see what we, how much we trust them and, and how insignificant we are, each of us, to Google. Like They don't gain anything you know, <laughs> doing anything to us. They appreciate us opening the app, but that's pretty much that's it. That's pretty much it, right? Uh, <laughs> Please click on our ads. But, yeah. but but to the extent where algorithms can become kind of making this more important decisions for us, to your, you're right, the fact that it's not controlled, that it's open, that it's inspectable, that's your thing. You can see the code for Bitcoin, you can see it running. And the fact that it's not controlled by anyone, it's actually pretty powerful, you're right. You could also argue that, go back to the algorithm that is analyzing the 2D image mm. and with a 3% error rate, if it was open source, it probably would be improved over time. Oh, 100%. 100%. Right? Just, oh. just get more and more eyes on it, 100, right? 100%. And then all of a sudden, you put a couple of million do- of dollars as the reward. Right? <laughs> right. And I think the other, point, the other point is that it it has a path to learning and improving that may be close to a human. Mm-hmm. I mean, you look at a lot of the stuff that has happened with DeepMind and the Go games. Mm-hmm. The puzzling thing is the path that they take to win. And that's kind of partly how they win because the guy looks at it and goes like, I don't, I don't know what strategy you're following, but they found this kind of, you see this also on, I don't know if you this company called 3D Metal. It's also a Venezuelan guy, by the way. And, and you see that they, uh, they kind of programmatically build pieces that have to you know, perform a function in a machine. And they end up looking kind of alien they're not what you would imagine. The, 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 the algorithm finds a path of like optimal weight and, and cost and whatnot. That is not what you expected. So I find that amazing, right? That they'll find yeah. solutions that we're not finding. It, it's, um, I think people have jumped all the way to conclusion. Maybe it was Facebook where they had like two algorithms supposed to be like talking to each other or something. <laughs> they're like, oh, shut this down. Like, we don't know what they're saying. <laughs> like Terminator style, like yeah, whatever. Yeah, Microsoft had an issue with this. Like okay. a bot that went nuts on Twitter. That yeah. Was fascinating. yeah. <laughs> and, and when you kind of see it, you're just like, look, uh, sure, there's risks here or whatever. Yeah. But most of this is pretty simple. And I think your point about like, get rid of all the noise. Just focus. What exactly this is? It's a predictable monetary policy, and that's pretty powerful on its own. It doesn't need to have all the bells and whistles and this yeah. and this and that. But no, it's just this is what it does. Yeah, and I think in the case it's like what's sophisticated about Bitcoin is not the monetary policy. It's actually very simple. What's sophisticated is your is the protections that had put in place, so it's permissionless, that it cannot be censored, and it's very hard to attack. That's what makes it amazing. Actually, the actual monetary policy is what we all want. Very simple. Very, very simple. Yeah. Before I let you go, because I know we're running out of time here. Um, when you think back over your career in technology, what's like the one or two biggest lessons that you've taken away that you think people in the Bitcoin, crypto, kind of decentralization world could uh, benefit from? Are there specific lessons, whether it's around you know building teams, building certain types of technology, uh, servicing user bases? Like, What do you think are like one or two really big lessons that you're like, you know what? 
if I'm at one of these companies right now, or I'm building one of these projects, here's two things that I think is like pretty applicable across the board. Let me see. Very simple question. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. I think one aspect that I feel more confident in saying is that I think when new technologies come, I think a broad mistake in kind of technology businesses is that we tend to try and fill market holes. We see the market and we're like, why don't we have a Uber for dogs? Right? Mm -hmm. it's, 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 and that type of game, uh, you know, dog walkers are important and it has the same type of supply and demand, et cetera. And that type of kind of thought process kind of very kind of system-wide to an application, sometimes yield good results for sure, but often it just yield um, unproductive things mm -hmm. because that type of thinking often is the opposite of what like, you know, PJ and YC guys would say, which is build things people want. And so sometimes that market hold is there for a good reason. No one cares, right? And so uh, particularly when the new technology comes, uh, you know, we start learning. We start learning to do things with like deep learning and some kind of machine learning stuff. A bunch of the applications built around that are built because it can be built, not necessarily because people kind of want any of this. Mm -hmm. And what happens with crypto, to some degree, is that it allows for a lot of things to be built that were not possible to be built in the past. And and I, I don't know if that's avoidable in any in meaningful way, but I certainly I think a good reflection is to think of where. Am I just tinkering with the technology uh, because I think it's cool and because I see the system and I find a hole and I think a plug goes there? Or do I actually have some sort of validation for demand and to understand what demand is coming from and to understand the customer needs and th that type of stuff? I think that's I think that's one. And the other problem, which I think it's kind of, I think there's many camps around this, but I think one of the problems that I've seen, particularly with crypto, is things over financed, right? Um, you know, a, a lot of money is very problematic. Right? You, you and I have talked about this before. It's the yeah. idea that uh, you can starve a company or a product by not having enough money, but you can also uh, kind of drown it, suffocate yeah. them, yeah. right? Right. <laughs> Literally give them so much money that all of a sudden they don't worry about money yeah. and very quickly they spend it all. Yeah, sometimes you have to stop taking money, even if it's being offered to you. Uh, it is very hard. It is very important. And I think that's true because, again, people who would argue against this point would say money is not always available, so you should take it while you can. Um, there's some truth to that. I think the counter argument, which I'm trying to present, is that, uh, and this is true of corporations and of individuals, is that when you have more money than you know what to do with it, you s tend to start making silly decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, you start not seeing trade-offs. Trade-offs get obfuscated by money. And so you throw money out of it in the hopes that the trade-off would kind of go away, but the trade-off is like in the metal mm -hmm. of the consumer experience of the product. So you have to go fix for that and not just throw money at it. Um, or you may kind of grow too quickly and kind of get the wrong user base. Uh, and then there's like the practical implication that if you're a shareholder or like a token holder and have an equity holder on, on a, of an asset that has been, you know, vastly overpriced, then, you know, it's like a highway where you just start taking exit, exit, exits out of the highway, right? And you're like, well, now I have to get the tank to make it all the way from Miami to West Palm Beach because I took all the exits out. And that seems sometimes, you know, there's some value in burning the bridges for sure. But, um, but I think it's, I think you, I think you calculate. You're like, okay, it's very far, but, 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 but I'm not the jump that I'm making. I know what it's gonna take, and you know what I mean. So it, it almost feels like uh, rationality is uh, the holy grail. Right, it's if you can rationally assess what do people actually want, probably you're gonna build something valuable. If you can rationally think through under value or underfunded versus overfunded, right? You can kind of find that moderation and say, hey, this is what we need, right? Um, if you can kind of think through all of these things, it really just boils down to, and I think one of the things that you do so well is just like the clear thinking, right? And, and kind of the rational thought ends up being an advantage when the world is so irrational or people around you are so irrational. I think also, I think it's an issue of like sticking to first principles, right? Which is what lets, allows you to say, as we were saying before, you know, divide the kingdom in one ep epoch and then like 200 years later say, you know, unite the kingdom and you're being principled and that you haven't mm -hmm. really changed them. I think the same thing happens. I think you can be widely risk taking and bold in kind of your vision and the product making and the, what the technology needs to do or the, the thing you're trying to achieve in crypto or otherwise, and then be widely conservative on the management of your funds mm -hmm. until you know what to do with them. And I think you have to be able to like, and it's, and it's not, I don't think that's in conflict. And I mm -hmm. think it's a, pers a certain perspective, which is the one that I would warn against, 
that make you think those things are in conflict. And you're like, well, if I'm super bold, then I'll take all the money. Then I'm like, well, maybe not. Maybe yes, at sometimes yes. I mean, if you're Uber and you're competing on the ground, uh, maybe you do that. But even then, maybe you overextend yourself. And maybe mm -hmm. you shouldn't have gone to Asia. Asia, you should have stayed here. Maybe yes, maybe not. I, you know, who knows? And they own a bunch of Didi and maybe that was a brilliant idea. But my point is that sometimes the, uh, the correct thing maybe to take all the money in the world it often is not. And I think in crypto, just because how things are, yeah, it may be problematic. Yeah. I tend to think that you're right. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Good. Where can we send people to find you on the internet or read more of the stuff you write? Um... I What's guess. your Twitter account? Ah, uh, my Twitter account. Yes. Okay. Jay Geller. So that's J G H E L L E R. All right. And then when you write, I I start a little blog, Geller that co. So G H E L L E R that co. All right. You're not going to say it, so I will. It's very very good. Uh, heavily heavily underrated. Hmm. Uh, I've tweeted a couple of times. You have a few yeah. of them. You bring a I lot actually, of people because I actually find them valuable. Yeah, uh, so I highly suggest that. go to Geller G H E L L E R dot co, and they can read it there. Yeah, All right. and then follow them on Twitter. Oh my god! <laughs> Thank you for doing yeah, this. Yeah, that was fun. I will right, we'll do it again in the future. Yeah, let's.